Finance and Policy Committee together to order. Uh, for the record, uh, quorum is present. Members, uh, some bills we're going to hear today and uh, lay some of them over. Uh, first group of bills from uh, Senator Chizinski and uh, Senator Dornick uh, deal with uh, AURI and some requests and the projects they are uh, bringing in front of us. And so uh, we'll get started with um, Senator Jasinski, uh, welcome to our committee. Uh, Senator Jasinski, uh, the chair will move 25, SSF 2537, 2337, excuse me, uh, to uh, be uh, in front of our committee and uh, laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, Senator Jasinski, tell us about uh, your bill, and um, I, I understand you have an amendment as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Senate File 2337. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank my co-authors, Senator Johnson and Senator Dornick. Uh, as you said, this is an AURI uh, bill uh, asking for $2 million in fiscal year uh, 22. Uh, actually, we're going to change that with the A1, so I'd offer or ask someone to move the A1 amendment, uh, and Senator, I'll explain the amendment after that. Senator uh, Murphy, would move the, would you move the A1 amendment? Senator Some Murphy moves the A1 amendment. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Uh, to the bill as amended, Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Murphy, for moving the A1. Uh, this bill was introduced actually last cycle, uh, so what the A1 amendment does is just change the dates to 2023. Uh, this uh, is a, a one-time appropriation. Uh, I know you have a big agenda today, so with that, I'm just going to bring up my uh, testifiers. Uh, Mr. Dan Skogan and Shannon Schlicht uh, to uh, go over the bill. And first, I'll have Mr. Skogan, please. Welcome uh, to our committee, um, Mr. Skogan and uh, Shannon. I'll let you guys introduce yourself for the records, and uh, you know the routine. Welcome, and uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dan Skogan, the Government and Industry Relations uh, Director for AURI, the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute. And I'm uh, just here to help with the Q&A portion of the uh, day, so I will introduce Shannon Schlecht, our Executive Director. Mr. Schlecht, welcome to our committee. Identify yourself for the record. Uh, and we've got a few more bills related to this member, so uh, we'll, sit, we'll hear from uh, Dan and Shannon for a little while here. But uh, identify yourself and uh, tell us about the bill. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And, uh, uh, speak to this this bill and this uh, need for ARI uh, for an infrastructure request. Uh, this bill was has been um, in in play as since last year, as was mentioned for our Crooks and Wasika sites. I'd really like to focus on our Wasika needs uh, for the for the coming year for this bill today. Uh, we have outgrown our our lab space that we've had in Wasika for over thirty years as an, an organization, uh, and uh, today we are operating out of two different uh, sites uh, in Wasika. One on our main site at the University of Minnesota Southern Research Outreach Center. Uh, and in 2018, we added a space at the Clear Lake Press for another 3,300 square feet. Uh, what we'd like to do is to bring both of those uh, sites back under one, um, one roof again, uh, so we can be more efficient, uh, right, and, and just make sure the safety of our employees and not having to go back and forth and um, going between our, our two labs where we, have, uh, where we have equipment and where we conduct our projects. Uh, we um, uh, are in the Clear Lake Press site, which is a building that is up for sale, so it's not a good long-term um, opportunity for us, and it's a larger space than we need as an organization. Uh, so uh, that is uh, um, the, the urgent need that we have for, for Wasika, right, just to make sure that we can continue to operate there. Uh, as I mentioned, we'd like to upgrade uh, and incorporate that into one roof. Uh, we'd look at either uh, upgrading our current site that we have at the University of Minnesota, uh, or looking at other buildings within Wasika or, or doing a greenfield site to uh, fit our needs uh, and to, to fit our space needs there. Uh, we expect we need a minimum of 12,000 square feet uh, for our equipment and our growth plans to look forward for the next 15 to 20 years. Uh, as I mentioned, we've been in the same site for 30 years and uh, we, have, we have really outgrown uh, that with our uh, continued work in the core product space and the continued demand uh, that we continue to see in this core product space as companies look at different ways that they can utilize their, their byproduct streams of biomass processing uh, and look, ways, um, look at ways to add either fertilizer, fuel applications, uh, feed applications, whatever that might be uh, with their, their processing streams. Uh, we have not had a, an upgrade in, in Wasika, uh, to my knowledge, uh, uh, with the organizations. So this would be, again, the first time in, in several decades. Uh, our last uh, uh, um, infrastructure upgrade was uh, with a bonding bill a few years ago where we upgraded some um, sites in Marshall. 
uh, and added a few equipment. So uh, this is um, uh, something that we uh, have not have not um, done frequently uh, in terms of uh, looking for upgrading our, our current sites. Uh, and with that, I, I do think if we uh, um, receive this funding that we could really set ourselves up for, again for the next 15 to 20 years uh, to continue servicing the agricultural industry and adding value uh, to the egg processing and the um, producers uh, here across the state of Minnesota. Uh, with that, Ms. Mr. Chair, uh, I'll finish my testimony. Thank you, uh, Mr. Select. Members, are questions? One question I have, where, where, where would the site be and would you be closing down some current locations then if you're gonna move from two to one? And, and I'll just add to that question, do we, while we bring efficiencies, do we kind of bring inconvenience to uh, consumers across the state where uh, two sites might at least have them somewhat closer to a, to a research site? Uh, if you could expand on that a little bit and where would you be proposing this one? Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair, for the, for the question. Um, what we would do, our current sites are about a mile apart from each other in Wasika, uh, so they're relatively uh, close to each other. Uh, so we would just be consolidating that that's those two different locations that we have and we we'll seek under one one roof. Uh, currently, we have about 6,000 square feet at our main site and about 3,300 square feet at our secondary site. Uh, and we would propose um, putting that under one 12,000 square foot space, giving us a little bit of room to grow uh, into the future. Uh, so we don't have a location picked out. We're still working on our due diligence of uh, where that would be, uh, what that might look like, uh, but it would uh, uh, continue to maintain um, our site in that Wasika area. Uh, in southern Minnesota. And we would continue our other sites in Marshall um, and as well in Crookston. So we wouldn't be consolidating any other outstate locations uh, with this. Okay. Other questions, members? Just my my parting last other question, um, Mr. Schleck, the what 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 would the research be in Wasika or uh, in because in Marshall, it's it's like a food commercial food kitchen and and other things. What what types of things are in the Wasika lab, uh, and, and are they different and unique from Crookston or Marshall? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, the uh, the Wasika location is really focused on our co-products focus focus area or byproducts uh, uh, that we have uh, in egg residue processing. So. Our main uh, work that we do currently in the Wasika location, which, which would not change, uh, would be our um, looking at drying applications. So we have a, a fluidized bed dryer that we can do uh, research around energy needs and how that relates to scaling up to commercial practices. Uh, we do pelleting, um, so a lot of densification work to create feed pellets and fuel pellets for renewable, renewable fuels. Uh, we also have a food, uh, we do have a food grid laboratory for oilseed pressing. Uh, there where we're looking at the, the meal uh, off the press uh, and utilizing that for different crop, app, uh, different ingredient applications as well. Uh, and then we have our hemp decorticator uh, in Wasika as well, looking at different fiber processing uh, and uh, ways that we can uh, look at the fiber uh, from, from industrial hemp crops. Uh, so it's very much focused on biomass processing uh, would be the main work that we, we would continue to do in Wasika. Uh, and again, a lot of, uh, I'd say, byproduct streams from agricultural processing, seeing how we can add value uh, and um, add some additional uh, value to businesses, right? They're utilizing egg biomass in their, their production practices. Thank you. Uh, other questions, members? Having none, uh, thank you, uh, Senator. Recording in uh, progress. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to want to make a comment. This is a very important for the Wasika area, a very agricultural uh, community. As Senator French knows about how important uh, it is uh, to Wasika because he's just a neighboring uh, legislator there. Uh, so again, Senator Dornick as well, thank him uh, for his involvement in this. And I look forward to uh, getting the funding to uh, put these under, under one roof again. I think they expanded a few years ago, had to lease some space. That space is now being sold. So they need to incorporate it uh, to make sure they can expand and uh, continue the future in Wasika. So thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Very good. Thank you, Senator uh, Chizinski. Uh, members, uh, the bill will be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Very good. Thanks again, Senator Chizinski. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank and the uh, Senator Dornick. Uh, uh, Senator Dornick moves Senate file 3335 to be uh, considered and laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Senator uh, Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Tell us about your bill and any amendments. 
Tell us about the bill, and then uh, we'll go to. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, two and members. It's uh, Senate File 3335, and it's appropriating $1 million to ARI for the purpose of including equipment, but I'm extra equipment for the Wasika and then uh, the other uh, facilities. But uh, I'll introduce my guest or my testifiers again. So it's Dan Skogan and Shannon Schlick. And so I'll let them testify on the first one. Go ahead, Shannon. Very good. Uh, Mr. Schlepp, do you want to start on this or Mr. Skogan, whoever? Um, very good, Mr. Chair. This is uh, my name, is Shannon Schleck, the executive director again, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll kick this one off. Uh, so our, uh, um, this request is to add new equipment uh, and replace equipment uh, that we have at ARI. So each year, um, the organization goes through a budgeting process and we, we uh, budget for, for replacement equipment or equipment needs uh, overall. But, and we also um, receive donations from industry for synergistic pro projects. Uh, and we uh, look at secondary um, equipment all right, or, or used equipment on the secondary market for uh, ways to upgrade our laboratory facilities as well. Uh, in addition to exploring federal grants and other uh, funding opportunities to continue to make sure that we have the right equipment in place to best service the, the industry. Um, that said, uh, a one-time supplemental or a one-time request for funding would really help us add some additional equipment that we have not been able to, to add uh, so far for continuing our work. Um, for example, we've conducted market research showing that there's a, a need or there's a gap in protein scale-up equipment uh, within the state uh, in terms of looking at how do we go from benchtop to pilot facilities uh, and uh, how that could service our feed um, providers as well as our food applications uh, overall. We've got great work going on at the University of Minnesota, uh, right from a research standpoint. Uh, we've got pilot laboratories and we've got a great industry right in the food and feed space. Uh, but how can we help some of those new innovations continue to scale up and make it through that, that journey? So that is one area of equipment that we would like to, uh, we would like to explore um, adding. The other is we're seeing a lot of interest around fermentation technologies. Uh, and uh, fermentation, right, is, is a, uh, not, a, not a new science, but uh, right, we see it in the ethanol industry. We see a lot more possibly for the food and feed industry as well. Uh, and adding some uh, supplemental equipment around fermentation, uh, we, are, we will receive some uh, fermenters uh, donated from industry uh, for some projects, but this would really help us uh, scale up and provide some other services there as well. Uh, and then we, our needs uh, for an analytical laboratory in Marshall um, would also be helpful. There's some, some uh, minor needs that we need there that could really help us in terms of new uh, analytical procedures uh, that we're seeing requests for uh, and to continue serv servicing that industry. And then there's some small biomass processing, again, for our Wasika site uh, that this uh, money would be used for. So uh, kind of a, a spread across all of our different sites. Uh, I'd say that looking at the protein scale up is really the big, the big ask uh, that we have here in terms of this, uh, this um, uh, request for funding for equipment. Thank you. Uh, members, questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I see uh, the last bill that Senator Jasinski Jis had was related to capital investment, and that was for um, equipment offices and property. And I'm seeing this bill here is uh, coming, uh, but it doesn't mention uh, anything regarding capital investment. And I'm just wondering if that was... Uh, properly written that way or is there explanation as to why it didn't uh, have that title on it? Maybe staff can address that. Um, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Senate Council. Painter, do you have a answer to that? Or? My apologies, Mr. Chair and Senator Anderson. Could you please repeat your question? Senator Chizinski's bill, Senate File 2337, uh, the title of it says it's related to capital investment. And inside the bill, it talks about acquiring property, construction, and equipment offices and research laboratories. On this bill here, Senate File number 3335, it doesn't talk anything about capital investment, and yet it talks about equipment upgrades, laboratory infrastructure, and installation expenses. And I'm wondering why this wouldn't be considered capital investment also. Um, my apologies. I'm not certain I'm going to answer that question, but I can certainly look into it and get back okay. to you on that. And uh, Senator Dornick, any comments or Mr. Schlepp? Or, and, and maybe it's just an internal. Basically, Senator Anderson, are you wondering if Senator Jasinski's is more of a bonding capital uh, request as opposed to cash? Well, Mr. Chair, I'm just looking at these bills and it looks like they could all be capital investment bills and why why weren't the bills written in the same 
same uh, type of uh, verbiage as the other yeah. bills. So that's the question and wondering okay. why it why it didn't go that direction. And, I, and it sounds like you're talking about cash versus bonding, but uh, I, I I just don't need a, an answer to that. Sure. Uh, why don't we do some check, Senator Dornick? Or any of you have an uh, Mr. Chair, answer to I, it? I was under understanding of the equipment upgrades and replacement, so that's my understandings of uh, what we're using the money for. So I thought I was uh, not need to be bonding. But. And what Senator Anderson will will ask Council to get us some answer. I, I do know there's some stipulations on bonding, but the first bill does sound like it might be uh, brick and mortar. So that does seem like maybe it would be capital investment potential, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, but other questions, uh, members? Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, um, Senator Dornick and Mr. Schleck and, and Mr. Skogan. Uh, I am wondering if you could just say a little bit more about the protein scale up uh, processes and what kind of equipment you need. If you could just explain a little more, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Schlepp. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Murphy. Uh, so what we're looking at from a, a protein protein scale up is uh, looking at how do we go from, from grams, um, the equipment that's needed to go from grams to say five pounds to 10 pounds a day uh, that would provide a food business or an entrepreneur or a company with um, the right amount of ingredients to actually do some product formulation, uh, um, uh, right, have the, the, the volume uh, basically to do that, that continued work. Uh, we, uh, uh, in terms of the specific equipment, I, I can get back to you on, on what that all, all entails. Uh, really, we'd be looking at separation into isolates and concentrates uh, based for, for use into feeds or foods, uh, right, for uh, scale-up purposes. Uh, then that could be taken and moved into a, a pilot facility, which could be 50 pounds a day uh, for that next scale-up process. But we're missing that, that in-between um, space right now from our uh, assessment that we've done with industry. Um, what would be most beneficial to help businesses working in this um, protein space, if that answers your question. Senator Murphy? No, you're good. Other questions, members? Uh, Mr. Schlepp and Mr. Skogan, uh, I'll maybe just ask this, and it kind of can apply to some of the upcoming uh, bills as well, but um, maybe just highlight, I don't know if you have top three or top five or interesting projects, things you're working on. I think that would be uh, interesting for the committee to know. I know you continually are looking at different things that, that connects to what some of this equipment does or makes a difference for the research uh, as, as you're looking at new ag utilization, value added opportunities. So, so, so kind of a broad question, but blend that into this, and then we'll move on to the to next sen Senate file. Uh, if you can kind of give give that perspective for the committee, I think it would be helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We've yeah, we have a, a number of, of projects that are underway right at the at the institute. Um, I think this past year we opened up over 100 projects, uh, worked on over 200 uh, overall, and just uh, continue to see a, a flurry of activity. Uh, I'd say um, one of the areas uh, that is is interesting is uh, looking at these new um, um, fermentation opportunities, uh, right? Using agricultural uh, residues, so everything from, you know, think about glycerin or, or starches, or how can you use some of these these materials into new uh, value-added opportunities that hit uh, the right nutrient profiles for different feed applications or different different food applications. Uh, I think that's an area that we're going to continue to see interest in, as well as just efficiencies that ethanol companies or biofuel companies are looking at as well. Uh, in terms of um, right, just looking at different feedstocks again, or, or how specific you want to get on uh, looking again at your efficiency gains, and, and what does that mean to your overall um, overall revenue model? Uh, so that, that's uh, one area where some of this equipment would be would be helpful, and we're already uh, making investment from the board level, uh, and this would really supplement our ability to work in in some of those um, uh, in that space uh, overall. Uh, the other uh, uh, area, just uh, I mean, protein is just exploding. I would think I'd say in demand. Uh, we uh, last year ho um, hosted a open innovations around sustainable proteins. Uh, we had 10, uh, 10 challenges that were proposed by Minnesota businesses, uh, including producer groups up through our Fortune 500s, uh, looking at what are ways that we can look at our, our footprint of what we're doing uh, and really uh, what are some needs that we have from either uh, shelf life to 
um, right, looking at what are the key variables from a sustainability standpoint that we should start to tackle or, or what does that mean back to a producer level uh, to uh, looking at what are some of the byproducts from um, plant protein applications uh, that could use an additional value stream to make those companies more viable. Uh, so, I mean, that's uh, across the board uh, overall. And as I, I mentioned, we have we did an industry assessment of over um, 20, um, 20 companies across that are operating within the state, uh, right? And just uh, a lot of them came back and said, this is a, a very clear need uh, for us to continue to, to grow our businesses and to, to grow our, our opportunities. Um, so that is a, a, another area uh, that we see. And then um, this whole biomass processing space, uh, I continue to be amazed at what we're seeing from a um, companies looking at their, I'd say, circular approaches to what they're doing uh, and how can we um, make sure that things aren't going into landfills and coming back into a, a value stream opportunity. Uh, and that, that area continues to grow for us. And uh, that requires different, right? We have everything from fish waste, right, to uh, um, uh, wheat stocks to corn stover, uh, and it all requires slightly different equipment uh, for us to take a look at it, to uh, look at processes, to look at the, the nutrient profiles that are in it in terms of what the best use of it might be from a, a feed or a fertilizer or a, or a fuel standpoint to help them make those, those decisions. So those are, are a few um, uh, projects that come to mind. I'll let Mr. Skogan um, add in any additional uh, thoughts that he has there as well. Mr. Chair, uh, Dan Skogan with the URI. Mr. Skogan, go ahead. What I would add to that is, uh, especially in our co-products lab in Wasika, we have uh, developed a national uh, recognition of our expertise there. And uh, we have a wonderful staff down there uh, that is taking uh, these processes, these egg processes, collecting the waste stream and redeveloping it for another revenue stream for our clients. And, uh, you know, when we work outside the state of Minnesota, we get to charge back our, our full cost of, of doing business, which is uh, good for our revenue stream as well. And uh, we're finding clients that uh, do not reside in Minnesota that are finding AURI very helpful. And uh, these kinds of equipment upgrades are just going to allow us to continue to do that. Very good. Thank you. Uh, other questions, members, on this bill? With not with that, uh, with no questions, I'll chair will lay over 35 SF 3530 3335 for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Uh, Senator Dornick uh, moves Senate file 3336, yeah. 3336 uh, for possible for, for consideration and possible inclusion in an ag omnibus bill. Senator Dornick, tell us about uh, this bill and uh, then we'll have your witnesses as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Yeah, this uh, one is one-time money appropriates two hundred fifty thousand to RE to conduct an era. Let's see, aerobic digester feedstock study to use in the production of renewal natural gas. And this is in Wasika, and I had an opportunity to take a tour of the plant uh, about a year ago, and got to meet the staff, and I got to see this uh, what what they're doing with it, and it's technology we really need. So it's a good project. So I'll let uh, Shannon tell us more. Mr. Schlecht, identify yourself again for the record and to this bill. Uh, Mr. Chair, Shannon Schlecht, the Executive Director of AURI. Uh, so th this bill is, uh, is uh, looking at anaerobic digestion for, for the state. Uh, we have been uh, amazed, I would say, at the, uh, the interest that we're receiving around anaerobic digestion and renewable natural gas markets uh, overall. Uh, we um, um, uh, have, as, as Senator Dornick mentioned, uh, we're able to obtain a portable anaerobic digester um, in a semi-trailer, so a 53-foot trailer that's, that's our Wasika office to really uh, do some really good validation on feedstocks in terms of their gas potential uh, and looking at the digest state as well for, uh, for that as a, a value stream. Uh, what we would like to do with, with this study is, is take a look at um, all the different uh, feedstock opportunities across the, the state of Minnesota. Uh, and help uh, look at a high level, that first level layer of where are some, some volumes and some critical mass volumes of feedstocks that would work really well for renewable natural gas markets and, and then um, right, look at the associated digest state uh, that would come from that for applications into agriculture uh, back to the producers as, as well. Uh, also with the Natural Gas Innovation Act that was passed last year, uh, right, there's some additional potential for tapping right into the um, utilities uh, that could use nat renewable natural gas as well. Uh, and we think looking at this approach of finding these critical um, masses that we think we could we could find with this type of a study uh, could help some smaller producers be able to participate uh, in anaerobic digestion as well. Uh, That's a big capital investment, uh, as we know. Uh, it typically has to be a pretty large large size farm to for it to pencil out. 
uh, but there's a, a lot more interest in uh, community digesters. We've been convening a, a thought leader group around anaerob anaerobic digestion for the last couple of years to get ideas and input. Uh, and uh, we're seeing some new business models that might be viable uh, for investment as we look at, again, the National Gas Innovation Act and the low carbon fuel standards out in the, the West Coast uh, that could allow some other parties to participate that is in that as well. Uh, and that's why we'd like to take a look at this. It would really be a, a high level uh, um, layering again, uh, then that, that we could make publicly available for companies to do a deeper dive on a feasibility uh, study in terms of what makes the most sense. Thank you, Mr. Schleck. Members, questions? Question, one question I've got is explain just a little bit more of what, what would you do with the, the digestion? And are you talking gas that might get pumped into a, a gas pipeline or, or other types of uh, CO2? Or can you explain that just a little bit more, Mr. Schleck? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what we would be doing is taking an assessment of looking at um, uh, dairy farms uh, in different regions, right, or what would be in a, a critical mass in terms of uh, manure use into a digester that we could um, consolidate or, or do more, more of a community approach, uh, looking at egg processing that's occurring um, along in those different areas as well. So you would have a consistent feedstock of, right, different feedstocks uh, from, from different, um, uh, different sources, right, to ensure that you have a consistent supply throughout the, throughout the year. Uh, and then we would be overlaying that with uh, infrastructure that already exists. So, so pipelines, um, as you mentioned, in terms of could you directly inject it into a pipeline or what type of investment might be needed to reach a pipeline? Uh, and uh, does that make the most sense or are there opportunities for um, burning the methane for electrical generation as well to put back into the, the grid? Uh, so there's a, a lot of uh, potential opportunities there. Uh, what we would do is really um, taking a, an assessment of that feedstock uh, looking at the, the renewable natural gas potential of that feedstock in, in given regions or uh, given locations, uh, and just doing that first cut, um, I'd say feasibility study on, uh, is there an opportunity for some community digesters and for um, participants that aren't currently uh, able to participate due to um, economies of scale, uh, that we could find a solution for them to uh, participate in that type of, a, uh, that type of, a, of, of an approach. So, so Mr. Schleck, um, it makes me think of, uh, a couple months ago, I was touring in my district, a company called Amp Energy uh, out in Stevens County. Um, and they're digesting on a dairy farm, uh, scrubbing and making methane gas. They put in a private pipeline to a, uh, interna inter or a international pipeline uh, that runs to Chicago. Um, so they're already doing it. I'm trying to think of what, what would you do in this case for that situation, or are we studying the same thing that they've already figured out? But the second part, you, you mentioned um, for, for entities that maybe don't have the economies of scale, uh, how, how would you connect them or an amp energy that I just talked about? Would they bring you samples of I don't know, manure or other biofeed stocks to try to say what, what else could we get out of this? And then that's some of the testing you would do. And then it would go back to an application to a farmer, consumer, uh, and, and you'd try, they'd try to develop more opportunities in their farm and their, their community. I, I, do you see where I'm going with the question? I'm just trying to make the connection here of how how would this apply and what, what would we do to be adding value and, and not, not duplicating what in some cases might be going on already? Yes, yeah, so, thank you, Mr. Chair, for, for the question. Yeah, the, uh, we, we definitely don't wanna be duplicating uh, what's already going on or where industry is making investment. Uh, and uh, what, what our work would be would be more of a precursor to that, that larger industry investment of uh, I think like AMP Energy has already identified an area where there's uh, critical feedstock masses, all right, and are moving moving forward or have moved forward with uh, anaerobic digestion capabilities uh, and their their value stream market that they have. I think what what we're seeing or what we'd like to do at this is look at this more from um, right. What are are there other areas in Minnesota uh, that we could help um, businesses identify through this uh, type of an assessment uh, for them to go in and then make that that investment uh, into setting up an infrastructure doing 
a, a contract or right, however that arrangement is made uh, in terms of putting that infrastructure into, into place. Uh, so I look at it as, you know, possibly could, could we identify critical mass zones of several small dairy farmers, uh, maybe an egg processing company, right, where, where one entity on their own can't move forward with an anaerobic digester just because of the cost, uh, but could we find critical pockets where there's multiple players that are interested in it because of the feedstock availability uh, where we can um, start to make some economic sense uh, for it to take a, a deeper dive uh, into that feasibility analysis that, uh, that uh, at a company that runs digesters would uh, come in then and uh, have a head start right, on getting that investment made. Very good, thank you. Uh, other questions, members? No further questions. Uh, uh, the chair will lay over uh, SF 3536 for possible consideration in an omnibus bill. 3336, excuse me, SF 3336 is laid over. Uh, next, uh, Senator Dornick moves Senate file 3354. That's correct. For, for, possible, for consideration and possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Senator uh, Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Uh, this, to this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This bill appropriates a one time money again, 600,000, to, to develop a fill, <clears throat> uh, and fill a life cycle analyst position. Uh, this approach, appropriation would remain available until uh, June 30th of 2026. Mr. Schleck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Shannon Schlechting and Executive Director at, at ARI. Uh, so this th this would be a one-time appropriation for us to establish some expertise uh, and a position looking at uh, life cycle assessment for agricultural businesses. Uh, this is an area, again, where we're seeing a lot more interest and a lot more questions uh, in terms of uh, companies that are looking at their sustainability profiles and trying to make business decisions or commute, changing consumer um, preferences. So we'd like to, to jumpstart our ability to, to fill, that, fill that role, uh, to provide education to companies that are asking those questions uh, and uh, provide them some, some, some variables to be thinking about in more of a holistic approach uh, that they should be thinking through as they're, they're looking at making some of those decisions around uh, their sustainability, sustainability profiles and, and what they're doing to make their, their business decisions. Uh, there, there are consultants, uh, right, and there's um, uh, ways that you can do this in, in business today. Uh, they're very tactical approaches where a company comes in and right, asks for something very specific. Uh, our role would be very different from that in terms of taking more of a business development holistic approach in terms of uh, what you, should you be considering, what are the constraints, uh, what are the opportunities, and really helping them think through uh, that process and how they would go to a third party for uh, validations um, and to really move those, those opportunities forward. Uh, again, based on the interest that we're seeing um, from biofuels companies, which um, I think we'll, we will soon see from food companies as well, uh, I think there's a, a high, high likelihood that we would um, see this uh, type of position filled uh, with industry contributions going, going forward, uh, which is why we're asking for just a one-time appropriation uh, for this type of a role. I think there's also a lot of uh, federal grants and ways that we could uh, um, leverage uh, and supplement this, this type of position uh, that we would be uh, creating here as well to provide that type of education. I look at, at larger companies, right? They all have uh, sustainability departments or directors of sustainability. A lot of our mid-sized to smaller companies uh, right, can't afford that type of a resource, and this would really help them uh, answer some of those questions that they have and how we could support them in moving their, their ideas forward. Um, I'll stop there, Mr. Chair. Very good. Uh, Senator Goggin has a question. Senator Goggin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a question for you. It says this is a one-time appropriation. What happens after 2026 to the individual that, <clears throat> that you have in that position? Mr. Schleck. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Goggin, uh, very good question. Uh, I, we feel uh, quite confident from the interest that we're seeing here that we can receive enough support uh, through uh, project fees and grants uh, to support this position uh, and, um, and not require a continued, continued fund uh, through our base appropriation for this type of a, of a role. Mr. Chair. Follow up, Senator Goggin. Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Chair. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Schleck, do you have a definition of the life cycle analyst position? Is there one in statute? Mr. Mr. Schleck, and, and to that question, I kind of have the same thing. What, what, I'm not exactly sure what they're going to do. Uh, I, I know you just described it, but maybe I think to Senator Anderson's question, a little more clarity, uh, what would we do? And then Senator Frentz has a question. Uh, very good, Mr. Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson. 
Uh, so the life cycle assessment position, we haven't created a position description, um, so to say, uh, uh, yet. Uh, what they would be doing would be looking at um, decisions that companies are making around their all right, sustainability profiles, everything from carbon intensity to greenhouse gases to um, right ways that they are, are looking at making uh, decisions and what is the impact on their, their um, sustainability profiles uh, overall. So helping them with that calculation, that framework, uh, thinking through all the different variables that they might want to be con considering, right, from, from air quality to water quality to uh, greenhouse gases to, to carbon intensity, and just uh, being their, their, their mentor and guide uh, along that journey to help them make that decision and if it makes sense to move forward with business, uh, business development opportunities uh, in those areas. Um, so that's, uh, um, I can get back to you with some more details uh, on that, but it's, it'd really be looking at that, uh, more of that, right, when we think of a, a sustainability um, position at a, at a large company, right, helping them out on, on what is our, right, scope three emissions, right, are there ways that we can do or what are some changes that we should make to our business practices to uh, meet some commitments that we've made uh, and how can we help them um, in that process or in that journey uh, to do so. Senator Anderson, any follow up? Hi, oh, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm, it's uh, curious, uh, I almost could say, uh, what's the life cycle of a frog's position? Uh, because I don't know what it is, if there's no definition, and so I'm just curious. Now, anyway, I, I look forward to some more statistics. Very good. Senator French. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Dornick. Uh, Mr. Select, half my question just got covered by Senator Anderson. Thanks for the um, context on sustainability. Uh, when you mentioned the uh, possible federal grants. Uh, I assume you're talking about matching and how we want to be competitive. Do you mind telling the committee a little bit more about what you might see if we're able to fund that position and how it might help the state? Mr. Schleck. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Frentz, uh, so I would see this as helping our smaller businesses or mid-sized businesses getting getting ahead in terms of, of thinking through their consumer preferences, where consumers are going and how they're making decisions. Um, for example, we're seeing uh, snack foods, right, that are, are labeled as, as climate friendly, uh, right, um, for, for example, and ways that uh, companies are, are looking at um, how do they meet the, the environmental preferences for, uh, from consumers for, for different attributes, uh, right, whether it be um, through lower greenhouse gases, through uh, different carbon intensity, uh, through uh, different production practices, uh, such as regenerative agriculture, uh, this person would really help um, be a guide in terms of right, how do we help make help them make business decisions uh, to capture some of those opportunities that that uh, exist uh, or or may exist uh, going into the the future uh, overall. And we're seeing um, I, again, I, I just a lot more questions uh, in this area, uh, and uh, mainly from renewable fuels producers right now. I think looking at um, um, low carbon fuel opportunities. Uh, and just how they're they're trying to position themselves, uh, but we're also starting to see it on the food side, and we're seeing things um, labeled as regenerative agriculture, for example. Uh, what does that really mean? Because it's a very broad uh, definition, just like sustainability is a very broad definition. And I think there's a lot more questions uh, that companies have than answers right now. And uh, we want to be able to help those right um, growing Minnesota companies or startup companies that don't have the the resources internally uh, to be able to provide that type of uh, that type of service. Senator Frentz, any follow-up? No, but thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to be continued. Very good. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, I want to thank uh, Senator Dornick in particular for authoring these proposals, and I know we have one more to come. I keep thinking about uh, the FFA leaders that were here last week, um, talking about the ways in which they want to participate in agriculture um, in farming, in marketing, in the science uh, of agriculture in their future. And as I look at the proposals that you're bringing forward today, I think this work that we're doing together is gonna help pave the way for their futures and for the futures of Minnesotans, our markets, et cetera, this important part of our economy. But I just, I wanted to thank you for paying so much attention to this work because I think it is really important, especially for those young leaders that we just saw here last week. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Any other questions, members? Having none, uh, the chair will lay over uh, 30, SASF 3354 30, uh, for possible consideration in the ag omnibus bill. Senator Dornick, uh, last mm -hmm. bills you have. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Move uh, SF 3337. 
for consideration and possible inclusion in the Ag Omnibus Bill. Tell us about this bill and uh, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is ongoing 200,000, provides uh, funding to increase to ARI. Um, and ARI is a 5013 nonprofit corporation created by the Minnesota legislator to foster long-term economic benefits through valued added agriculture products. In addition to legislative appropriation, ARI also receives funding from project fees, charitable gifts made by individuals and companies. So this is an ongoing uh, appropriation. So, Mr. Schlick. Mr. Chair. Mr. Mr. Schlick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, Shannon Schlick, Executive Director at ARI. Uh, so this is a, a cost of living adjustment for us to continue the, our work and to support our most valuable asset, our, our staff that we have at, at ARI. Uh, when I started at the organization a little over six years ago, we were in um, around uh, in the high 20s. I think we we're at 27 employees. Today we're at 34 employees uh, overall. We've been able to grow our employee base uh, largely through um, some additional funding that we've received outside of the, the, the normal appropriation process. Uh, but we do continue to have a, a cost of living uh, right increase every year through, through rent and through um, salary increases and merit increases, uh, ways that we're trying to keep our, our employees um, and uh, focus on the mission and the, the good work that we, we try to do for the, the state of Minnesota and the agricultural industry. Uh, we've um, you know, reduced our, uh, our appropriation percentage of, of our overall budget from 86% down to 73% over the last four years. Uh, to, so that's allowed us to add several additional uh, staff, uh, staff members and different resources to the organization. Uh, but we do continue to have uh, rising costs and we're not a state agency so we don't get uh, automatic increases. Uh, and our cost of living, as, as Senator Dorick mentioned, as a 501c3, uh, we uh, um, are not an, an agency. So this would uh, uh, help us uh, offset those rise, rising costs that we uh, face year after year in terms of uh, increases to our, our normal operations that we have as an organization. Uh, Mr. Chair. So uh, Mr. Schleck, would, would this, this go, go to, to just, just existing, existing operations uh, or would it be a new position uh, that, that's being funded? Uh, Mr. Chair, this would be uh, existing operations. Uh, we do not have plans to add a, uh, another position with this. Uh, for example, if we look at a 5% increase uh, right to our, um, to our, our budget, uh, that is uh, basically the $200,000 uh, level right now. I think uh, we're looking at uh, cost of living increases for, for um, positions at a much higher rate than we've seen in the past, uh, and our rent uh, increases have, have continue to go up as well. So this is really an operational increase for us uh, and not adding an additional resource. Questions, members? Uh, so, so Mr. Schlecht, uh, before, before we have you leave, or Mr. Skogan, uh, if you want to chime in uh, talking about uh, positions, um, talk to us just a little bit about the, the meat, uh, meat positions and uh, the equipment that we added uh, last year. Uh, while you're here, I guess I think it'd be a prime opportunity for the committee to also hear about that as it's still a pretty um, uh, current topic uh, of interest as well as uh, development in our small rural meat markets, uh, especially butcher shops. Uh, can you just kind of bring that in to, for the committee's perspective and for our, I mean, us uh, as we try to evaluate uh, this bill and, and the other bills we heard, and uh, just give us a quick update on that while you're here, if you could. Um, very good, Mr. Mr. Chair. I'll I'll, um, I'll start on that. Um, so we uh, again, thank you very much for the past support and for the support of the meat, meat science position. Uh, through those dollars, we were able to uh, to hire a, a meat innovation specialist that started with us the end of December. Uh, he is on part time until he finishes his graduate degree in um, uh, in August. Of this year, so he's working for us a, a couple of days a week and, and hitting the ball running. Uh, what those funds allowed us to do, though, as well, was to create a technical assistance agreement with USDA, uh, which has allowed us for an additional two years of funding to bring on um, one other meat scientist as well. So the the dollars that you uh, provided us have allowed us actually to double uh, what we expected to do uh, through a partnership with with USDA. So we are working now um, uh, on I'd say five pillars of a program. Uh, one is looking at the finance opportunities and the providing assistance in terms of what, what type of funding um, opportunities or tools would be most beneficial. Uh, we have a, uh, a regional focus that we're doing with our neighboring states uh, that we're starting this week that we'll be looking at resources that are available and how do we um, not duplicate but actually do synergistic uh, efforts 
uh, across our, our five state regions. So looking at the, the Dakotas, Iowa, and Wisconsin, we'll be getting together regularly uh, to talk about opportunities and how do we share resources to uh, move, those, move that forward. Uh, we're creating a resource database uh, as well for um, local and regional meat processors for questions that they have. Uh, where can they get certifications? Where can they find suppliers, uh, right? Advance some of the opportunities or questions that they may have. Uh, we're doing a, a short needs assessment as well, just to make sure that we're hitting the right, the right buttons uh, for them in terms of the assistance that we provide. Uh, and then uh, with the, uh, the two positions, we have one focus on business development and one focus on technical assistance uh, currently. Uh, so they will be providing one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, assistance to those businesses as, as well uh, to help them overcome constraints or look at opportunities and help them troubleshoot uh, and uh, really think through what are some of those investments that they'll, they'll be making in their businesses. Um, so uh, yeah, the, um, the, uh, the assistance uh, that you provided was, allowed us to do a, a great leveraging, I think, to really help uh, assist uh, that segment of the, the industry. And then additionally, we uh, have done our, the mobile meat slaughter, um, $500,000. Uh, we did a request for a proposal. Uh, we awarded that to um, uh, Farmers Union uh, overall, and they are moving forward uh, on that, that process as well. Um, so uh, that is in, in motion um, currently, and uh, I don't have a, a, a ready update, or a, a maybe Mr. Skogan has uh, in terms of where that stands today, but uh, we are in process of working with them uh, to implement those dollars uh, and to, uh, to move that, that forward as well. Mr. Chair? Uh, Dan Skogan with AURI. Mr. Skogan, go ahead. I would add to that uh, uh, on the mobile meat slaughter project, it's, it's been a great experience. Uh, I was on a call on the way down here today. Uh, they uh, believe they have gotten a letter of confirmation that uh, an EDA grant that they applied for to help stand that program up has been approved, and they just need to get through a few uh, little uh, changes on the grant uh, proposal to, uh, to make it happen. Uh, Farmers Union, of course, is, is going to own that uh, meat slaughter, mobile meat slaughter unit, uh, but they are going to cooperate with uh, CLC College out of uh, Staples and Ridgewater out of the Wilmer area, and uh, both of those schools are putting together meat cutting and butchering programs now, and uh, they are going to be uh, working through this program that you guys uh, funded money for last year uh, to uh, workforce development. CLC and Staples has already had uh, over 50 students show interest, and I believe they're in the teens now on uh, uh, kids that have actually, or students that have actually registered for the class that's going to start this fall. And uh, they were hoping to be around 10 the first year and around 15 the second year, but they uh, look like they're going to far exceed that now. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for that update. I think that's a uh, uh, helpful for us to hear and uh, certainly part of the, the value added uh, agriculture that uh, fits within your mission and I think it's good good for us to see those connections and see what happens uh, when we pass bills and, and how it can can uh, bring leverage uh, other other types of investments so uh, appreciate Mr. that. Mr. Chair if I could add one more comment Mr. from the cattle growers up in the the Brainerd uh, Lakes area, uh, they held a meeting uh, to discuss the curriculum for the uh, CLC campus, and uh, they really uh, were enthusiastic about uh, the mobile meat slaughter uh, program and really feel it's going to take care of part of the bottleneck that they've been uh, focusing on or, or, or dealing with uh, through the last uh, two and a half years at least. Very good. Any other questions, members? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I see by the language that we passed last year that this was a one-time appropriation until June 30th of 2024. What's, what's your for, forecast after that for this particular position? Mr. Schlecht? Uh, this is uh, regarding to the meat, the meat science position? Yeah, so our, um, so we, uh, Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Uh, so, um, so our, I mean, our, our hope would be that we continue to um, receive support from from the state for for that role. We think it's, I mean, livestock is a, an essential um, component of our agricultural marketing value and to our producers uh, overall. We uh, have historically had a meat, meat science position at ARI, uh, but we did we did struggle for several years of finding the right um, candidates, uh, right for for that position uh, overall and. Uh, We've been very fortunate, I think, with support coming from, from USDA to help leverage that, that position. And 
uh, I think we'll, I mean, we'll be seeking some additional uh, grant dollars and support and industry support as well, uh, but I think we will continue to need some, some support for, um, for our meat science role uh, from, from the state as we continue moving, um, moving opportunities forward in that, in that sector. Senator Anderson, thank you. Any other questions, members? No further questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Schlecht, Mr. Skogan, uh, Senator Dornick. Uh, any uh, parting comments before we lay, lay over these bills, uh, this last one? Uh, go ahead. Yes, Mr. Chair, and thank you. I just want to thank my co-author, Senator Dames. Uh, I want to thank uh, my testifiers, Mr. Skogan and Mr. Schlecht, and their staff and for the work they do. Uh, do great work, and also to members and Mr. Chair for hearing our bills. Thank you. And uh, uh, Mr. Senator Dornick, um, members uh, uh, sits on the, the governing board uh, as well for AURI, and uh, thank you for for doing that uh, on behalf of the Ag Committee as well. So, uh, with that, uh, the bill is uh, laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, Thank you, Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, one more bill. I'm going to hand the chair over to uh, Senator Goggin, and uh, I'll head up to the testifier table. Senator Westrom, we have uh, Senate File 3617 uh, in front of us. Thank and you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, I would move uh, Senate File 3617 uh, for consideration and be re-referred to the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, so moved, uh, Senator Westrom, and to your bill. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members, uh, this is a, a rural broadband bill uh, to allocate uh, additional federal dollars that uh, our state is uh, eligible to receive, uh, but also uh, needs to put a spending plan or a plan in place to allocate these dollars. And this would uh, take the $110 million of federal money, the ARP money from last spring, and uh, commit it to the Office of Broadband and uh, have them continue to deploy this to uh, build out rural Minnesota or any areas in our state, uh, even uh, uh, a metro area that would be a uh, unserved area uh, at the end of the line or uh, just any areas that are hard to serve. Uh, some of the more difficult areas are getting to be closer uh, to what needs to be accomplished right now. We've heard from other uh, uh, others in the industry about even doing a pilot project through the Office of Broadband to help uh, fund that last mile. Um, and so this $110 million would be a huge shot in the arm to have the Office of Broadband uh, continue to put out through their grant process. They have been a, uh, a real gold standard across the, the nation. What we have done here, I think, uh, working with industry, a one-time 50% grant or uh, if we can develop a pilot project in some cases, uh, maybe a little more for the last mile as we've talked about before. Uh, but this is a way to really get our unserved areas in the state uh, with that infrastructure we need put in the ground or built out so uh, those unserved areas, less than 10% of our state, uh, can actually become part of the uh, broadband system we have. <coughs> Excuse me. And so with that, Mr. Chair, uh, we have a couple testifiers. Uh, also, uh, uh, so, so maybe we start with uh, Nathan from the Rural Broadband Coalition. And, uh, 
Uh, we Senator Westrom, we do have the A1 amendment here, uh, the, the author's amendment. That's that technical uh, Mr. change. Mr. Chair, I would I would move the A1 amendment to get the bill in the proper shape. I believe it's just a, a correction of a statutory reference. Uh, Ms. Painter, maybe can just clarify that. Uh, Ms. Painter. <coughs> Mr. Chair, members, that's exactly correct. Uh, with that, uh, we'll move the uh, A1 amendment uh, that Senator Westrom has to the author amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Amendment is approved. All right, so first off, we'll start out with uh, Mr. Zacharias. If you would please uh, introduce yourself to the committee and proceed with your testimony, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Nathan Zacharias, and I represent the Minnesota Rural Broadband Coalition. We are an advocacy coalition made up of organizations from local government, education, agriculture, and healthcare sectors, as well as cooperatives, broadband providers, and more. And our mission is to make sure that everyone in Minnesota has access to a world-class, affordable broadband uh, internet connection wherever they live. You should all have received our letter in your packets if you'd like to look over our membership and, and further comments on the bill today. Um, I want to begin today by thanking Chair Westrom and the members of this committee for your part in securing $70 million last session for broadband grants in the previous budget. And I'm here today to ask for your support of Senate File 3617, which is a bill that would fund the border-to-border -border broadband grant program with an additional $110 million from the Capital Projects Fund our state grant program, as Senator Westrom earlier said, is the premier program of its kind and one of the best ways to build broadband networks in unserved areas. Uh, the Treasury Department approved three ways to spend this money and the coalition strongly prefers that it be used for infrastructure grants as outlined in the bill. Currently, 170,000 households do not have service that meets the state's 2022 speed goal of 25 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload. 240,000 households do not have service that meets the state's 2026 speed goal of 100 megabits per second download by 20 megabits per second upload. And most of these homes are in rural Minnesota. We do have a lot of work to do to connect every Minnesotan to broadband but I believe Senate file 3716 will move us closer to true border-to-border -to -border connectivity and help us meet our state statutory speed goals. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Zacharias. We will hold off on questions right now. We'll have Mr. Ahern uh, to give his testimony and then we'll open it up for questions. Mr. Ahern. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Mike Ahern. And I'm first here to apologize that I am not uh, Brent Christensen, the head of the Minnesota Telecom Alliance. Uh, Brent um, wanted to be here, but he <laughs> did, couldn't get back into town uh, in time. Um, and I'll, I'll spare you uh, a repeat of really what uh, Mr. Zacharias just told you. Is we, there's, um, there's still a need for funds, and we think at, at this point the MTA um, has been a big part of trying to bring out, build out the, the broadband to rural Minnesota. Uh, and there's a lot of money uh, still available, uh, uncommitted um, at this point. And this legislation provides a good nudge to uh, the administration to direct that um, to a program that works. Um, so uh, we would uh, heartily encourage your support for this bill. Thank you, Mr. Ahern. Uh, questions? Senator Friends. Thank you, Chair Goggin. Thank you, Senator Westrom. Uh, thanks, testifiers. We're going to continue our work on broadband until every home is wired. We're going to celebrate that day in someone's driveway. Meanwhile, though, um, for the definition of the ARPA Act funds, I think it's a little bit more broad. And so the obvious question before we commit $110 million is what are the other possible uses the state of Minnesota might put this to? And I was sort of thinking 
um, that the author might field that question, but that was just a compliment, really, Senator Westrom. Uh, Mr. Senator Chair, Chair, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator French, uh, I'll start and then I'll phone a friend. And so uh, it's good to have a f good to have friends in this business. So, uh, but Senator French, there's three different areas uh, that I understand that the, the dollars can be spent on. Infrastructure being one of those, which is the primary area we focus. Uh, another aspect is devices uh, potentially could be purchased. Uh, or other e types of equipment to establish uh, uh, in, in centers or, or areas that, that can be bought or, or, or set up as established. And Mr. Zacharias, I might pitch to him. I think he's got a pretty uh, good handle on, on the other options that could be used uh, that he had touched on in his testimony, but uh, we can also uh, pitch to council for a little more in depth uh, to your answer. Uh, Mr. Akaraz. Mr. Chair and Senator Frentz, yes. My understanding is, is that in addition to the devices that Senator Westrom mentioned, that there is a third category that would be available to community centers or community facilities, perhaps schools, for either construction or improvement. And I hope that um, Council would agree with my assessment on that. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, yes, I believe that's correct. Um, just to reiterate, the three uh, eligible uses would be broadband infrastructure projects, like Senator Westrom stated, um, devices, you know, included in digital connectivity technology projects, and uh, multi-purpose community facility projects uh, would be the last, the third eligible use. So, I believe what was stated is correct. And thank you, Ms. Grunewald. Mr. Chair, to wrap that up for Senator Frentz, uh, I've also uh, been told, and my understanding is that it can't be to buy service. It has to be just for, for actual infrastructure. So, albeit if you bought devices or put infrastructure in the ground, the, the service that somebody might receive would have to be something else purchased by an individual party, not with these funds. Senator Friends, follow up. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Westrom. I just think as we, you know, look at the appropriation, we want to make sure we've considered all the possibilities. I would guess we'll hear from some who think, hey, what about this idea? And it'll be good to be able to say we discussed it in the Agriculture Committee when Senator Goggin had the gavel. Thank you, Mr. Right. Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Westrom. We are thorough, Mr. Or Senator Friends. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, no further questions for you, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, I just think it'd be a good opportunity to note that's good to have lawyers and engineers on this committee. <laughs> he can handle the uh, the paperwork, and I'll handle the hardware. How's that? <laughs> All right. Seeing no further discussion here, we will uh, uh, take the vote on, on moving this to the Finance Committee. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion approved. You're on your way to finance, sir. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Good and work. with that, that uh, gets us to our uh, end of our committee hearing here today. So uh, seeing no further business, we'll be adjourned. Thank you.